Ready? Yeah. Welcome to Abel. I'm Callan Blair. I'm an actress living in New York City. I'm Allie B. Gorey, and I'm an actress living in New York City who happens to be visually impaired. Our goal is to make the entertainment industry a more inclusive place, one conversation at a time. We hope to break down the stereotypes surrounding disability in film, TV, and theater. It's time to see art that mirrors all the people who support it. It's time for ABLE. We were kind of hoping you'd bring Beyonce, your cat. I know! And 900% she was going to be here but because I had to go shoot the PSA. I didn't bring her, but I swear I was going to bring Beyonce. So the first thing we've been asking everybody is, why are you an artist? I'm not qualified to do anything else. Like customer service, I don't have the temperament. Cardiologist, I don't have the coordination. But like, I am an entertainer. The way I ended up on this path was that instead of sending me a physical therapy, my parents sent me a tap class. And instead of occupational therapy, they sent me to play piano. When I was a senior in high school, I did an on-point ballet, like on my tippy toes ballet number, to win beneath my wings. <laughs> because you can't get more Jersey than that. No. <laughs> and I got a standing ovation, and I totally thought it was because I was badass and had no idea I was inspirational. Oh. And if there had been social media, they would have ruined everything because um, I would have gone viral. Yes. We've had people talk about inspiration porn. Yeah. That's With their, disability. That's their... Yeah, that's what yeah. they call it. So I have to admit, I'm kind of a sucker sometimes for it. Yeah. So like, there was this chick that was like, I'm walking. I think her I name was Mia. Oh. And I just freaking love her. And I was like, yeah, Mia. And like, I didn't even care what was behind it because it was such a champion moment. Yeah. You know, could you take us back 17 years ago when you were first yeah. starting your career? Because I would love to hear your, a little awesome. bit about your journey and how <laughs> I mean, it's not easy with casting directors now, and I know it wasn't even, you know, 17 years ago, they were much less informed. So tell us how so, you got started. I graduated college, and I had an incredible, incredible theater teacher named Marshall Mason. He introduced me to my acting coach, Tanya Berzin, and that's how I started, and that's how I got my acting start. And then when I started auditioning, it was really the reaction of the people in the room that told me. Like, I'll never forget, there was one audition, I walked in, and the woman looked at me and she just went, no, no, no. Like, she couldn't even, like, figure out what was happening. So Tanya Berezin told me, you're not going to get cast. They're never going to cast you because you're disabled. This is just not going to happen. And what you need to do is write a one-woman show exactly like Nia Vardalis. That's what she told me like my big fat Greek wedding. Let them know who you are, let them know how you can act, let them know what you can do. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna write a one, one woman show. And I was at this Thanksgiving event and I'm telling these heart-wrenching stories and everybody is laughing their heads off. They were just laughing hysterically and I was like, ah, oh, I have a gift for this. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to become like Richard Pryor. He's brown, he shakes, he's a comic, he's in movies. I'm totally going to do this and then they'll put me on General Hospital. So I signed up for a comedy class at Caroline's Comedy Club on Broadway, took a six week comedy class. Final class was a big show at Caroline's and at my first show ever I got hired as a paid comic. <laughs> so like I didn't suffer at all. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. After awesome. that, did you were you just solely set on comedy? Did you audition for theater stuff anymore? Was no, it just I, so here's what happens. I ended up not auditioning for anything for the first nine years of my comedy career because I was so busy touring, I couldn't. I was thrilled just being a touring comic, making mad cash and like seeing the world and flying first class with like Beyonce under my arm. And then <laughs> in 2010, my, the great, like the man who changed my life, Keith Oberman was on MSNBC and he needed a comedian to come in and comment about a story about Saudi Arabia. And I was the comedian who came in. And he shifted my entire trajectory. Because when Keith put me on TV, that's when I went online and saw that the whole, whole world was making fun of me. And that was when my privileged disabled bubble popped. I had parents who supported me. I was pretty much independently wealthy because we had sued the doctor who delivered me and won. And I had never suffered on the level that 
so many of my disabled peers and so many disabled people younger than me had. I had never been bullied. I had never been made fun of. And that Keith Overman show woke me up to what this world really was. And it was a rabbit hole because as I started realizing, oh my God, people do make fun of disabled people. Oh my God, there's a day of mourning for people with disabilities who are killed by their caretakers. Oh my God, people can't get health care. I started learning all these things about the disabled world. So you are a woman. Mm -hmm. You are part of the disabled community. You are of Palestinian descent. Mm -hmm. Are you, do you feel the responsibility to advocate for for yourself, for, it, for yes your communities? No. Yeah. Yes and no. So I look at my life in, as, as compartmentalized. When I'm on stage doing stand-up comedy, my one and only job is to make people laugh. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm frustrated with the political scene around me, I'll make a point while I'm making them laugh. Sometimes I go on stage and just want to talk about Britney. And, you know, I'm <laughs> not actually changing anyone's life whatsoever. So I freed myself from the idea that I need to always educate and always advocate. And, like, my people are being massacred, which they are. But, uh, you know, I don't want to constantly be that lecturer. But where, where I see my advocacy working more is in stuff like this. And the fact that, you know, when I go out and talk, I talk about what it's like to be a woman or Palestinian. I talk about the violence that people with disabilities face. I like to tell my audience, you're only one blood vessel pop away from being just like me. It really ruins their day. <laughs> but it gets them grounded in yeah. the reality of it's not really something to fear. It's so stigmatized. You know, I have to constantly, when I'm on stage, remind people that mobility devices aren't lazy and they're not quitting. And that, like, I'm not doing something better because I walk in heels than right. someone who uses a wheelchair. You know, I constantly have to remind people because even in the disability community, we have that hierarchy. And I didn't learn about it until after doing my TED Talk. And when I did my TED Talk and I got exposed to this really broad and bullied and discriminated against disabled population, I realized the role that privilege played. I realized that we have walking privilege and we have talking privilege and that other people don't have that and are treated as less because of those things. And it's important to know that we're not better. We're not higher on the spectrum. We're just, it's not a monolith. It's different for everyone. Can you talk about the New York Arab American Comedy Festival? I can, can. Yeah. The New York can, Arab can. Yeah, the New York Arab American Comedy Festival is in its 15th year. Uh, me and my producing partner, Dean Obadala, fa founded it in 2003 to combat the negative images of Arabs and Muslims in media. And we really didn't think that we would be here 15 years later still fighting that fight. Yeah. It has gotten so astronomically worse, and the threats have increased a hundredfold since 2015. It's really tough being Muslim in America right now. But what's cool about the Arab American Comedy Festival is it's not religious. You could be Arab in anything. You could yeah. be Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Mormon, atheist, you know, spaghettiist, whatever you want to be. <laughs> and, uh, and the comics aren't just Arabs trying to be funny. They're rock stars. They're hilarious comedians. We have Rami Youssef, who has his own show, Rami, on... Um, Hulu, we have Bassem Yusuf, not everybody's last name is Yusuf, but he was like the Daily Show correspondent in Egypt, and then you have me, and it's a really fun, hysterical festival. We do it every year at Gotham Comedy Club, so it's just like an old school, like rocking comedy club, and I love the lineup, and I love our camel. Our logo is a camel because we wanted to take back the whole camel jockey thing, and so our poster has all 15 years of the camel. I'm really proud of it. <laughs> How do you feel about disability representation in the media and what needs to change? Okay. I think it's extremely, extremely offensive when people with, when actors who are non-disabled play visibly disabled on screen. I think it's cartoonish. I think it's inauthentic. And I think that much like race, disability that is visible cannot be played. And the reason I use the word visible is we actually have no idea how many people with invisible disabilities grace our screens because the stigma against stuff like, you know, mental health issues, chronic pain, it's so strong that even stars don't want to reveal their, their diagnosis. Yeah. But 
people with disabilities, we're the largest minority in the world. We're only 2% of the speaking images you see on TV. Of those 2%, 95% are played by non-disabled actors. The fact that we are everything, we are part of every single group, is often ignored. Right. Yeah. So it's really important to me with the opportunity that I have to not only be a woman of color doing this, but also open the door for LGBTQ disabled yeah. characters, yeah. Uh, you know, characters of color, uh, non-binary. So with my show, what I'm trying to do is not tell everybody's story. I'm telling my story. Yeah. Disability is non-monolith. I can't speak for other people's experiences. I can speak for my own. But what I wanted to do was create a character who, if she was played by a different actress, wouldn't be disabled. The reason she's disabled is because I am. Right. Uh, We're not writing in the gimmicks. Yeah. We're just living, and you know, the centerpiece is a very funny friendship because I love like LeBron and Shirley and Lucy and Ethel. And I didn't yeah. want a woman who was chasing a man. I wanted someone who was like really into her own independence. And so it's all about being funny first. And like I said, we're not leaning on the disability like a crutch, but a bunch yeah. because, because we don't need to. I am. So I will limp. I will have trouble, you know, fastening things or my mouth does shake. So we don't need to write it in because like that's not the biggest part of this character. And I really want to see a mainstream grown up fully functional disabled person. We're always happy snowflake angel babies. For kids today, because I know it's harder and harder, especially, I mean, growing up with a disability, with social media, with, <sighs> there's just a lot going on in our world and I think bullying is worse than it's ever been. Yeah. What advice would you give to someone who's a young artist who happens to have a disability? Well, first of all, you have to be better than everyone else. You can't be just as good. Just like accept it. Everyone's going to underestimate you. You have to work harder. You have to know your limits and respect your limits and don't harm yourself in order to get where you're going. Instead, learn how to work with your body so that it will work with you instead of against you. And as far as like bullying and listening, you have to learn about criticism. Some criticism is necessary and you have to know when you're being told something that's worth listening to and implementing. And then you have to understand that random strangers on social media have no effect on your life. When I was on Countdown with Keith Oberman, somebody said I had chunky knees. And for the next three episodes, I made sure to cover my legs. And then I went back to find the comment for something I was working on, and I realized that it was a tight shot and they had never seen my knees. And I let a complete stranger dictate my wardrobe for three weeks straight. And that was the moment where I was like, you cannot let nameless, faceless strangers who have no effect on your life dictate who you are. Yeah. Yeah. But when it comes to real bullies, just don't hang out with mean people. I know it's hard. I know how hard it is to ignore. And I always say, you know, we were taught sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And that's simply not true. Words matter. And you never want to be the person who makes another person harm themselves. But I want people to get that fur, that armor, to go out there and be like, I don't care what random Sally says about me. I just don't and I know that it's hard and I know that some of us don't have the ability to do that the intersection of bullying with mental health issues is a really intense yeah. place that you can't just pull yourself out of so I always tell people when I speak to adults I say don't be an internet troll and don't raise an internet troll because the problem is not the kids it's the parents you don't have a kid writing any of that if the parent's not allowing it, if the parent's yeah. not influencing it, if the parent's not teaching it. And I understand that there are kids who don't have parents. Not everybody has parents, not everybody has that system. But somewhere in the system, we're failing to teach people decency. I was never bullied. I was never made fun of as a child. Why is it happening now? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So we probably have to play our game yeah. now. Yeah, we always wrap up okay. with a little, with a little yeah. game. <laughs> <laughs> so we do a little word association game where we're going to give you a word or a phrase, and we want you to tell us the first thing that comes to mind when you hear this word. Okay. Beyonce. 
No, I'm not ready. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm getting warmed up for the okay, game. Okay, forget that what I just said. It's okay. I'm ready. Stretch, yes. Go. Beyonce. Cat. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't expect that. I feel like it's a $25,000 pyramid. I'm yeah, just like yeah. saying No way, no way. Yeah. Okay. Accessibility. <laughs> a joke in America. Uh, Hollywood. Me. Yeah. Yeah. New York City. I love it. Happy place. Jersey. Jer oh, I was gonna say, <laughs> that was my next one. Oh my gosh. Um, social media. Addicted. Pizza. Oh, I can't eat cheese because I wanna be a vegan, but pizza makes me not a vegan. <laughs> There's vegan pizza. It's not the same. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> I know, I know. Accommodations. Complicated. Disability. Why don't I have a word? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I froze on disability. Yeah. It was too much pressure. Let's see. Uh, I don't know. I have no word. Okay, I feel fair. like I might have burnt out on the interview there. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm done. <laughs> I think you nailed it. Let's do the last word. Done. Love. 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 Hate. Oh, 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 We're done! We're done, guys! <laughs>